On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I bring you the story of Brittany Cosby and Crystal Jackson, two women who were found dead on March 7th, 2014, in Port Bolivar, Texas. Brittany and Crystal were both 24 years old and had been dating for two years. But in the early hours of March 7th, their bodies were found behind a dumpster. Brittany had been bludgeoned to death, and Crystal had a single gunshot wound to the head. When the women were found, they had no ID. But once detectives learned their identities, they discovered that not everyone in their life supported their relationship. The question they had to answer was, did that have anything to do with their brutal murders? This is Brittany and Crystal's story. The people who knew Brittany and Crystal to this day have a hard time wrapping their head around the circumstances that led to their murders. Many believe that their relationship was the reason they were killed, while others believe it was just pure jealousy. But regardless of the ultimate motive, this was a crime of pure hate. And the fact that it was committed by someone who was supposed to love Brittany makes this story that much more devastating. In 2014, Brittany and Crystal had been dating for two years, and according to people who knew the couple, they were very much in love and looking forward to their future together. Both Brittany and Crystal had grown up in Texas. Brittany had been raised mostly by her great-grandmother, Annie Lee Cosby. Her parents, LaRonda McDonald and James Cosby, had broken up when she was four months old, and she had lived with Annie ever since. Crystal had been raised by her parents, Reverend Ivan and Mary Jackson. The two women had met while they were both riding the same bus, according to reports, and they hit it off right away. Crystal had a daughter, and Brittany loved kids, and as the couple began dating, it was clear to people who knew them that they were both very happy in their relationship. Brittany was still living with her great-grandmother Annie when she met Crystal. At the time, Annie was in her 90s and was in a wheelchair, and so Brittany helped take care of her. Eventually, Crystal also moved in to live with Brittany and help with caring for Annie. And for a while, their living situation worked out great. The couple could save their money and at the same time, be there for Annie who needed her great-granddaughter's help. But in October 2013, Brittany and Crystal's comfortable living situation became uncomfortable. Brittany's dad, James, after being released from prison and having nowhere else to go, moved back into Annie's home with Brittany and Crystal. According to her mother and other family members, Brittany and James had a strained relationship. James had spent most of his daughter's life in prison. In 1994, he was convicted of sexually assaulting a then 22-year-old woman and served a 10-year prison sentence for that crime. After his release... James was supposed to register as a sex offender, but failed to do so, and he was sent back to prison in 2011, where he served another two years. It was after that that he came back to live with Annie and Brittany. Now, once James moved in, the atmosphere in the home changed, and Brittany and her father did not get along. And so Brittany and Crystal began planning their move. They had always wanted to have a place of their own, and the tension created by Brittany's father moving back probably helped motivate the couple to get their own place. And so at the beginning of 2014, Brittany and Crystal began making plans to move out. The first thing that they wanted to do was buy a car. After receiving their tax refunds that year, Brittany and Crystal put their money together and purchased a 2006 Kia Sorento that Annie had co-signed for them. After buying their new car, the women were focused on the next chapter of their lives and were excited to finally get a place of their own. But neither Brittany or Crystal would ever get a chance to live out their dreams. There are not a lot of details about Crystal and Brittany's last movements, but what we do know is that Crystal's parents said that they last saw the couple on March 5th, 2014, when they came past their house to pick up Crystal's daughter and show off their new car to her parents. After that, they headed back to Annie's house. Crystal's parents, of course, at the time, had no idea that 
it would be the last time that they saw their daughter. We know that night, Brittany Crystal and her daughter did make it back home. But one day later, in the early morning hours of March 7th, 2014, 58 miles away in the town of Port Bolivar, someone making a delivery made a shocking discovery behind a dumpster near a convenience store. At around 7 a.m., the man who was making his normal morning deliveries spotted what he thought were two mannequins at first behind the dumpster. He said that he went inside the convenience store and asked the clerk if she had thrown out a couple of mannequins. But the clerk had no idea what the delivery man was talking about, and so she followed him outside to the dumpsters. And when they went outside, they both realized that they were looking at two bodies. Port Bolivar is a small island located near Galveston, Texas, and the only way to access the port was via ferry from Galveston. There isn't much going on there, and so they don't get many homicides. And so to find two bodies behind a dumpster was not something the police would expect to get a call about. After the clerk called 911 and reported what she and the driver found, police arrived on the scene, and it was clear that they were, in fact, dealing with a murder. Well, two murders. The first victim was a woman. They could tell that she had a gunshot wound to the head. The second victim was lying face down and had a sheet wrapped around their head. Now, based on the clothing that the second victim was wearing, police were not sure at first the sex of the second victim. But once the medical examiner arrived at the scene and turned the second victim over and removed the sheet, they discovered that both of their victims were female. The second victim had been bludgeoned to death, but neither of the women had ID on them, and so investigators had no idea who they were. As they began to process the crime scene, it didn't take them long to determine that the two women were not killed behind the dumpster. Based on the wounds both victims had, there would have been way more blood at the scene had they been killed there, And so detectives believe that the women's bodies had been discarded at the dumpster like garbage after they were murdered. While processing the scene, police looked around searching for any wallets or cell phones that may help lead them to the identity of these two victims. And while they did not find either of those things, they did find other things that would prove crucial in this case. The first thing they found was a broken off shutter that had a distinctive white and green color. When they looked closer at the shutter, they could tell that it had blood spatter on it. They had no idea what it meant, but they knew it was somehow connected to the murders, and so they collected it as evidence. A few feet from the dumpster, detectives located a white envelope, and the envelope was covered in blood. When they looked at the address on the envelope, they saw the name Brittany Cosby and a Houston, Texas address. After finding the bloody envelope, detectives knew that at least one of the victims was probably Brittany Cosby. And since they had an address, they knew that they could visit the home and try to determine if one of the victims was Brittany. And if it was, they hoped that they could also identify the other victim. When detectives arrived at the address on the envelope, before even entering the home, They noticed that there are shutters outside that are the exact same as the ones they found at the crime scene, and one of the shutters is missing. When detectives knock on the door, they are greeted by Annie, Brittany's grandmother, and they ask Annie if Brittany Cosby lived there, and Annie told them yes. They asked if they could come in, and when they entered the house, they saw Brittany's picture, and at that point, they were positive that one of the people they found behind that dumpster was Annie's granddaughter, Brittany. When they broke the news to Annie about what they found, she was devastated, as you can well imagine. Detectives asked Annie about the last time she saw Brittany, and she told them that the last time she saw her granddaughter and her girlfriend, Crystal, was the day before. She said that she thought they had gone to work, but she hadn't seen either of them since. Now, once police officers heard about Crystal, they were positive that they had identified the second victim, Crystal Jackson. But now that police had confirmed Brittany's identity and were pretty sure the second victim was Crystal, 
they now needed to figure out what had happened to these women. While detectives were speaking to Annie, James, Brittany's father, came home. And body camera footage shows Annie the moment she tells James that Brittany was dead. And in the video, James appears to also be devastated when he's told about the murders. Detectives ask James about the last time he saw his daughter, and he tells them that the last time he saw her was the morning before. James confirmed for police that the other woman with Brittany was Crystal. He said that Brittany and Crystal left that morning around the same time that they always leave, and that it was a pretty regular morning. He said nothing was out of the ordinary. He said it was around 7.30 a.m., and they were getting Crystal's daughter ready for school. But he said instead of taking Crystal's daughter with them, Brittany and Crystal left without her. And James told detectives that he thought that they were just going to the store and that they would be right back, but they never came back. He said that they called Crystal's parents and they ended up coming to pick up Crystal's daughter. But neither Annie or James could think of any reason why someone would want to kill Brittany or Crystal. Neither of them had any problems that would lead to something like this. James gave police a description of Brittany and Crystal's car, which was missing, but while speaking to James, detectives also asked him about the shutter. And according to him, the shutter had been broken for a while. James said that a handyman who had come to the house was doing some work outside and that the shutters kept coming loose. He said that he had given one of the broken shutters to the handyman. And so detectives asked James if he had contact information for this person. And he told them that the guy's name was Pepe. Detectives wanted to speak to Pepe to see what he knew about the bloody shutter. But in the meantime, police put out a be on the lookout for the Kia Sorento that Brittany and Crystal had been driving. And... After getting Crystal's parents' address from the license, police went over to the Jacksons' home to break the devastating news to them. When police speak to Ivan and Mary Jackson and inform them of their daughter's murder, they are shocked. The news was unbelievable, but after speaking to Ivan, they discover that he did not approve of his daughter's relationship with Brittany. Ivan said technically Brittany wasn't even allowed to come in his house, and if she did, she could only go as far as the kitchen table, which he said even that he didn't like. Ivan did not mince words about his disapproval of his daughter's relationship with Brittany. Like the initial interview with Brittany's family, the interview with the Jacksons was also captured on body camera footage. In the footage, Ivan told detectives that he would tell his daughter that she wasn't really gay. Quote, I would tell my daughter, you're not really gay. You're just effed up in the head. Mary, Crystal's mother, said that she had accepted that her daughter was gay, but Ivan never could, and it caused a lot of tension in their father-daughter relationship. Ivan admitted that he and Crystal argued, and that the last time he saw her, they argued about her relationship. Ivan said that he didn't want his daughter living with Brittany and wanted her home so she could be more of a mother to her daughter. He told detectives that he told his daughter that Brittany would be the cause of her death. In that interview, Ivan also told police that he owned a 25 caliber pistol and that when Crystal vanished and left her daughter at Annie's house, Ivan was convinced that Brittany had something to do with it. And so he planned to take his gun and confront her. But he said his wife talked him out of it and he never went over to Annie's home. What Ivan told police raised their suspicions. It was clear he was angry at his daughter for being in a relationship with another woman, and he did not want to accept the fact that his daughter was a lesbian. As a Southern Baptist preacher, having a gay daughter went against everything he believed in, and he made sure she and Brittany knew that he disapproved. Once police learned about Ivan's gun, they collected it so it could be tested for evidence. They were not sure if Ivan was involved, but after what they were told, they needed to rule him out. As detectives began digging deeper into Brittany and Crystal's life, they had discovered quickly that not everyone in their lives was happy about their relationship. 
And now detectives had to determine if that relationship had anything to do with their murders. On March 7th, 2014, the bodies of 24-year-old Brittany Cosby and her girlfriend, 24-year-old Crystal Jackson, were found behind a dumpster in Port Bolivar, Texas. Once they were identified, detectives began trying to figure out who killed this young couple and whether or not their relationship had anything to do with it. After speaking to the families of both Brittany and Crystal, they discovered that Crystal's father did not approve of his daughter's relationship and did not like Brittany. He believed that she was the reason his daughter was saying that she was gay, something he believed was a quote-unquote experiment. He also had admitted to police that he was angry with his daughter and that he owned a gun. What Ivan told detectives had raised plenty of red flags for them, and so they needed to rule him out as a suspect. After their initial conversation with the Jacksons, Mary, Crystal's mom, came into the station along with Ivan to answer more questions. This time, detectives asked Mary about the father of Crystal's daughter and their relationship. And she told detectives that after their daughter was born, the relationship between Crystal and her child's father started to go downhill. He was not involved in his daughter's life, and Crystal had sole custody. After learning his identity, detectives brought the father of Crystal's daughter into the station, and he admitted that he was not involved in his daughter's life, and that the last time he saw her and Crystal was a month prior when he ran into them at a local store. He told them that he had nothing to do with the murders and that he was home with his mom at the time the murders were committed. He gave police a DNA sample that they could test, and detectives had no evidence at the time that He was connected to the murders, and so he was allowed to leave. But when the autopsy results came back, it revealed that Brittany had been hit at least five times in the back of the head and then strangled. Crystal had a single gunshot wound to the head. The wound Brittany had sustained led police to believe that she had been the initial intended target and that whoever had done this was very angry with her. The single gunshot that Crystal had received made detectives believe that whoever killed her had done it in a hurry. They were also able to determine that the bullet that killed Crystal had come from a high-caliber weapon, not a low-caliber one like the one her father owned. And so detectives were convinced at that point that Ivan was not the killer. And so while the initial part of their investigation had focused on people in Crystal's life, Detectives began to turn their attention to the people in Brittany's life. Now, a few days after the murder, detectives received a call from a man telling them that he had found a wallet with Brittany Cosby's ID in the side. He said that after he had found it, he mailed it back to the address that was on the license. But he said after watching the news and learning about the murders, he thought that it might be helpful information. Now, the location where the wallet was found was about a mile and a half from where Brittany lived. And that was significant because police were still looking for their initial crime scene where the murders had taken place. After speaking to the caller, investigators went to the area where the wallet had been found, hoping to locate additional evidence. But unfortunately, there was nothing in the area that was useful. But they did believe that they were close, and so they began pulling surveillance footage from around the area to see if they could spot Brittany and Crystal's Kia Sorrento. After pulling the footage, detectives lucked up when they spotted a Kia Sorrento matching the description of Brittany and Crystal's car on surveillance footage from a local store. The footage shows the car driving past about 15 minutes after James said Brittany and Crystal left. But detectives cannot see who was driving the car. However, They now at least had part of a timeline if the car was, in fact, Brittany and Crystal's. Detectives now needed to trace the movements of the car and see if it ever crossed into Port Bolivar. And so they contacted the ferry company to get a copy of the manifesto from the night before Brittany and Crystal's bodies were found. When they received the manifesto, it confirms that a Kia Sorrento did cross on the ferry into Port Bolivar on March 6th. Now, getting this information was a big break for detectives because 
They confirmed that a car matching the description of the car they were looking for was on the ferry that night. But police needed more. And so they requested to see their surveillance footage so they could see if they could determine who was actually driving the car and confirm whether or not this was Brittany and Crystal's Kia. Now, when they see the video, they are positive that the car is Brittany and Crystal's. But unfortunately, the camera angle only shows the car entering the ferry and you cannot see who's driving. Detectives also could not make out the license plate, but they were positive that this was the car they were looking for. Luckily for them, there were additional cameras at the ferry landing. And so detectives reviewed that footage. At about 9.13 p.m., cameras captured the Kia Sorento arriving at the ferry landing on the Port Bolivar side. It pulls up to where a security guard is standing. Detectives also noticed that one of the headlights on the vehicle was out. Now, when the car gets to where the guard is, he stops the vehicle and is seen talking to the driver. Suddenly, the driver gets out of the car, and detectives can see that the person driving this car was a man. But the footage was dark and grainy, and so detectives could not identify who was driving. After reviewing the footage from the ferry, detectives reached out to the guard so they could interview him. When he sat down with police, he told them that he did remember the car and that the driver was a black male he described as clean cut. But he told detectives that the driver seemed nervous and didn't seem to be familiar with the car. Detectives asked the guard to sit down with a sketch artist, but the picture, based on his description, didn't look like anyone in Brittany or Crystal's life. They showed the sketch to their family and friends, but no one could identify anyone who resembled the sketch. One of the people they interviewed was Annie's caretaker, a woman named Cora who came to Annie's house to provide additional help with her day-to-day -day needs. Detectives went to Annie's home when Cora was there and showed her the picture. She, like the other people who knew Brittany and Crystal, did not recognize the face in the sketch. But there was something else that Cora wanted to tell detectives. After going over the sketch, Cora told detectives that she wanted to show them something outside underneath the carport. She told them that something just wasn't right out there. In body camera footage, Cora tells police that the carport had been scrubbed clean, something that was obviously unusual. In fact, she said she had never seen it clean before. Detectives said they immediately started looking around the area, and that's when they discovered two droplets of blood in the doorway going into the converted garage where Brittany and Crystal stayed. Detectives believed that someone had tried to cover up a crime scene at the home where Brittany and Crystal lived, and so they requested a search warrant for the house. But while detectives waited for the warrant to be signed, they received the results from the evidence that they had found near Brittany and Crystal's body, and what they learned would break this case wide open. On the bloody envelope that was discovered at the scene, there had been a single fingerprint found. And when the fingerprint was ran, it came back as a positive match to Brittany's father, James Cosby. Detectives were shocked because before then, James had not really been on their radar as a suspect. But after they searched the home and took a closer look at Brittany and James's relationship, they realized that he was not the grieving father he portrayed himself to be. When the search warrant was executed at the home where Brittany and Crystal and James lived, detectives found a mountain of forensic evidence. There was blood not only in the doorway, but there was evidence of blood all over the converted garage. Quote, everywhere we were looking, we were finding something with blood on it. Tiny drops, bigger drops, pools, swipe marks. They were on the door, in the carpet, on the couch, on clothes, one of the detectives told True Crime Daily. Police had used luminol, and they said that when they sprayed the chemical, the room lit up. They also found during their search a box of bullets containing both 357 caliber rounds and 38 caliber rounds and they believed that Crystal had been killed with a 357. 
The lead detective on the case said that he had never collected so much evidence from one crime scene. After testing the broken shutter, detectives were also able to determine that the blood on the shutter belonged to Crystal. At that point, the evidence against James was growing, and detectives were convinced that he was involved in Brittany and Crystal's murder. After executing the search warrant and collecting additional evidence, James was picked up and brought into the station to speak to detectives. They asked him to tell them again about the last time he saw his daughter and Crystal, and he tells them the same story, but police are 100% sure that James was lying. They confront him with the evidence, including his fingerprints at the scene where the bodies were found, but James denies that he was involved. Detectives, however, had enough evidence to arrest James. His fingerprints on the envelope was enough to prove that At the least, he had moved the bodies to Port Bolivar, and so James was charged that night with tampering with evidence and placed in jail. When James was arrested, it was one day after Brittany and Crystal's family had held a vigil for the young woman, and at the vigil, James was in attendance and spoke. But when he was arrested the next day, people in the community were shocked. But people who were close to Brittany knew that there were deeper issues that existed, and apparently, Crystal's parents were not the only ones that did not approve of Brittany and Crystal's relationship. After James was arrested, Brittany's mom spoke to local news outlets and told them that she believed that James had killed Brittany and Crystal because they were lesbians. James apparently was Muslim, and according to Brittany's mom, he would say things about how Brittany's sexuality bothered him. After James was arrested for evidence tampering, detectives still needed more evidence to connect him to the murders. James had turned over his phone to detectives after his arrest, and so police were able to go through his call log. And that's when they discovered that on the night before the bodies were found, James called a number several times. They learned that the number belonged to a woman named Kimberly, who James had been dating, and so detectives contacted her and asked her to come into the station. Kimberly confirmed to police that on the morning the bodies were found, she saw James driving the silver Kia Sorrento. She had met him in the parking lot of a local liquor store that morning and followed him back to his house. She said she stayed with him until about 3 p.m. and then left. After speaking to Kimberly, detectives knew that James had lied to them, not only about driving his daughter's car that morning, but he also lied about his whereabouts because he told them that he was at home. A month and a half later, in April 2014, Brittany and Crystal's Kia Sorrento was found in the lot of a strip club in Houston. After weeks of searching, they had finally found one of the biggest pieces of evidence. When the car is opened, inside, they find blood all over the back of the car. And when they look in the corner of the trunk, they find the bullet that killed Crystal. Finding the bullet inside the car meant that the trunk had to have been open when Crystal was shot. Inside the ashtray, Detectives found cigarette butts, and so those were collected and tested for DNA. And when the DNA results came back from the cigarette butts, it was a match to James Cosby. After piecing together all of the evidence collected, including interviews, DNA, fingerprints, surveillance footage, and cell phone records, detectives were confident that they knew what happened to Brittany and Crystal on the morning of March 6, 2014. Detectives believe that Brittany and her father had gotten into an argument, and in a violent rage, James attacked his daughter, hitting her in her head multiple times and then strangling her to death. While the argument was taking place, they believe that Crystal had taken her daughter and put her in the car and then went back in the house. But when she did, she found the bloody scene and her girlfriend dead on the floor. Detectives believe Crystal, in fear for her own life, ran from the house, but that James chased her, armed with a gun, and when she got near the car, he shot her in the head, causing the blood spatter that they found on the shutter. After interviewing Crystal's daughter, 
Detectives learned that the five-year-old had seen at least part of the brutal murder that happened that day. In June 2015, James Cosby was charged with capital murder, and in 2016, he stood trial for the murders of his daughter Brittany and her girlfriend Crystal. The prosecution concluded that the motive for these murders was jealousy. They had learned that James was upset that his daughter had a car and money to order food for her and her family. Cora, Annie's caregiver, told detectives that the night before the murder, James was angry at Brittany because she could order a pizza and he had to eat a bologna sandwich. People close to Brittany, however, believe that it was her sexuality that was ultimately the reason why James killed his own daughter. After three hours of deliberation, James Cosby was found guilty of capital murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. While James denies that he killed his daughter, the evidence against him tells a completely different story. And unless he ever decides to tell the truth, we may never really know why James killed his own daughter or Crystal, another innocent woman. But what we do know is that neither woman deserved to be murdered. They did not deserve to be thrown away like garbage behind a dumpster. Crystal was a mother, and her daughter was there when she was killed. Only someone evil could do something like that. James Cosby will now spend his life in prison, and so there was some justice served in this case. But with a crime like this, there never is any real justice. May Brittany Cosby and Crystal Jackson rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads.